Yeah, there you are. Oh, hello. So thank you always for joining me for talking about talking about uh, your work on, on Doctor Who and of course your prestigious career in, in general. It's very, very kind of you to uh, to do so. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to ask um, what made you want to get into the film and TV industry to begin with? What were your what was that journey to, to, to get into work for the BBC? Well, you know, uh, I think it's a young person's dream always to be involved in the entertainment world, hmm. uh, especially when you watch movies as I did as a young kid. Uh, I was addicted to going to cinemas uh, and I was very privileged to be able to do so. I was in, in uh, colonial India. Uh, we had American movies showing at the Metro Cinema. Hmm. So you can imagine me growing up with all those musicals in my head and in front of me. Uh, and so I, I, I grew up watching musicals and, and of course, wanting to be a part of it. Mm. A fantasy of mine was to go to Hollywood and I had no idea how I was going to do it. But of course, that ambition lives with one. That particular fire burns inside you. And um, when I was a young kid, I directed plays at school uh, based on things that I had read about either plays that were notorious for what their content or something to do with controversy. For instance, I remember directing at my boarding school, I, there were house play competitions and I did uh, a section of The Crucible by Arthur Miller. Now, the reason I did that was because I had witnessed a rehearsal at the Bristol Old Vic where my school was, my school was, edu uh, was based in Bristol. So I was able to go, go to the theater a lot and that encouraged me, you see. Uh, the whole idea of directing was something a part of my life. Being, you know, what it does is it allows you to communicate with other people. And in my case, with people of my own age group, mm. uh, putting them into clothes that didn't belong to them, pretending to be somebody they weren't, but dealing with something that was obviously, as in the case of the Salem witch, witch hunts in the Crucible, is very common. And uh, so I was an enthusiastic director all my life as a child. Mm. So um, that's my story about how I, 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 I insisted on being interviewed for my future. You know, the uh, appointments board at university used to send you off to be interviewed, usually for, law, uh, for purposes of professional purposes, whether you wanted to end up as a lawyer or not or whatever. Mm. But in my case, I kept saying I want to go into television. Yeah. And uh, they thought I was a bit preco precocious. Uh, as a young man, I was in my 20s. And um, finally, I insisted and they, they opened the door for me. I'm very fortunate because mm. I'm sure a lot of people want to do the same and have the door open. And sometimes it's very difficult to keep your toe in that door to keep a jar. And in my case, I was very happy. I was selected. Um, which was a sort of unusual thing because I had no awareness of myself requesting these things to first of all break into the drama department of BBC television. Uh, you know, one is trying to break into an established um, medium. Mm. Um, I had no idea what I, I, how I was doing it. I wasn't being very daring myself but I knew that's what I wanted to do. Hmm. I think my uh, endurance persisted and they finally did allow me to do it. And I was put on a trainee course, for which I'm very grateful. Um, at that time, they didn't know what to do with me hmm. because uh, in, in my case, I, I would like to point out, I was the first Asian born British subject trying to do this. Hmm. And yes, it was something that I wanted to do. Um, so that's what happened. Hmm. I managed to get through the course. Yeah. And they didn't quite know what to do with me. I was hanging around. 
uh, I did a few things. And then ultimately, a new program came up, which nobody knew anything about, created by Sidney Newman. Now, you know, uh, it's very interesting to, to know about. I mean, how did Doctor Who get born? Everyone forgets about Sidney Newman. They don't give mm. him a credit at the end of the show. Uh, if you look at some of the long running shows like Coronation Street or EastEnders, the people who created them still get credits. In, in the case of Doctor Who, Sidney Newman should be given a credit because mm. here's a man who sat down and said, I want to do a, a, a series which will follow at 6.30 on a Saturday evening and be educational as well as adventurous. How do you combine education with entertainment? Mm. Doctor Who is the answer. Um, we went into the past for, and then into the future. We alternated. My very first episode started off with a quest for fire, which to be mm. honest with you, I never thought would work because there's nothing as funny as seeing people running around wearing skins. Mm. But at that time, there was a joke because in the cinema, there was a film called 10,000 Years BC with Raquel Welch, clad in skins, mm. barely concealing her body. But when people heard I was directing something like this with actors in skins, it sounded like a joke. Mm. <coughs> well, the reality is I did not want it to be a joke because I'd studied drama at university, I'd done serious stuff. I thought to myself, here am I having spent a lot of time studying Shakespeare, and what am I ending up with? Characters with uh, monosyllabic dialogue. Mm. I, it could be a joke and people would laugh. I didn't want people to laugh at me. So we decided with the actors to play it straight. Mm. And as it turns out, from what I gather, people who've seen the results, feel that it worked and that it did get hold of them narrative wise. And it was about four protagonists fighting a system and surviving it. Mm -hmm. The old man, Doctor Who, the whole point about Doctor Who is who is he? Where is he from? He comes from another space, another odyssey. He's made mm -hmm. a journey. He's a mystery in that. Sense. We don't know his background. He has, in our story, he had a a granddaughter. Who is this girl? What does she represent? She was meant to represent young people at the time, but she knew more than anybody else. So the mystery factor already played on the psyche of children watching. And uh, I think the adventure also worked because it meant that this character could transform into any being through time and space. That was done through a practical fact that uh, William Hartnell was ultimately too old to play the role mm. and someone had to replace him. And the show was such a success, Sidney Newman's brilliant idea was, why not have him change into somebody else, played mm. by another actor? And as long as he's quirky and strange, which is what happened. And since then, we've had a series of quirky actors young and old and age, and we've never explained them. I don't think you should ever explain this character because mm. he should be utterly unavailable. Yes. I mean, he's, unappro he's approachable in the physical sense that he can go through pain and through adventure, but he's untouchable on many levels, mm. on a scientific level. Yes. So that makes him interesting to an, uh, an audience. Mm. How is he going to survive? And of course, the whole idea of him being a mentor is an interesting one. And you've got young people who are learning from him and he usually has an assistant who learns through him. And so that's the story. The granddaughter turned into an assistant. Hmm. It's, it's a very good um, concept from the, from the get-go, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the first episode, the, the, the mystery of who is this man, who is Susan, um, Ian and Barbara, in the car, trying watching what Susan's doing, going into junkyard, 
uh, William Hartnell's entrance again, who is this, that this person that really sort of, I think it's a very, very strong opening ep episode just saying up the whole mystery of, and as you say, it sits a bit, and I, I think also the black and white, the fact it was in black and white, it obviously in hindsight makes it even more mysterious and um, I think it's something very special about the black and white episodes particularly. Well, uh, it's interesting that, I, it's funny, uh, I, I had no idea that the black and white would actually help our story, especially the going back thousands of years to Quest for Fire, it would mm. have been, I think, less realistic in color. Now mm. it's in black and white, it sort of does a monochrome world. Mm. Uh, now, of course, it's transferred and moved on. Uh, but in a way, I'm glad that we did it as we did, uh, the mystery of it all. I had no idea what I was actually doing in all fairness. Mm. Uh, I actually thought, I, you know, because the show, as you probably know, was doomed from the start because on the opening night, we thought that was the end of it. President Kennedy got killed on mm. the night that we were going to transmit. Mm. And uh, we saw it as a sort of sign, oh my God, is this going to be okay? Luckily, the BBC believed enough in it or were persuaded to repeat the story mm. and that's how the thing took off but you can imagine what we, what we were looking forward to the debut of this new series that got stalled historically mm. on a very important event mm. um, in fact the whole doctor who has survived through a series of very interesting incidents and it's been taken up by some very talented uh, creators like Russell T. Davis, who I think is did a marvelous job of re reviving it. Because as you probably know, it, it had a period of, uh, it sort of disappeared for a while. Yes. And it's been brought back to the conscience of the public, mm. for which I'm grateful. But people ask me what I think of the current show. And I think it's very difficult for me to explain what I feel. Mm. Because to be honest with you, I, I moved on in my professional life. Mm. And Doctor Who was my jumping off point as a director. Mm -hmm. It taught me how to work on tight stories, to tell stories economically within time and within the framework of budgets. I've learned a lot through Doctor Who. I'm mm -hmm. grateful, grateful to that as well as the BBC for which I'm proud to be an alumni. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that, I, I had the opportunity to do some major dramas of which I'm very proud, um, which allowed me to then move on into the outer world and took me to where I am now. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, do you think it, the fact that you were such a young director when you did Doctor Who, it kind of gave you almost a, you perhaps weren't as, as fearful of this, of this sort of epic sort of show that you, you were faced with because you were kind of sort of, you know, sort of, um, I suppose, with the fearless of youth, you were you know, quite interested in trying to do very complicated shots, tracking shots, um, POVs, etc. I think did that think that gave you an advantage being being so new? Well, that was uh, 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 you've mentioned the way I shoot, and the reason for that is I was very heavily influenced by watching films, mm. and I was totally aware that the whole thing about television is it can be very static, and it shouldn't be, mm. and um, the equipment it's studios were forbidding directors from being able to manipulate their cameras mm. in a in a visual way. Mm. Um, the thing about television is that it's not the same. We shot on video, for instance. Mm. Today, single cameras take over. We worked with multiple cameras in those days. Uh, mm. Doctor Who was shot on four cameras simultaneously. And you have to know how to work that. And I learned because each camera is attached to some kind of lead. And mm. uh, it's an electronic, uh, it's, it's, it's not the same as being able to cam carry a camera around on one's shoulder. Mm. These have to be pushed by single cameras per person cameraman and a camera. They are one thing, they are one individual. And these are machines. 
that have to be manipulated. Mm. Now, I tried to copy what I saw on film being done with so much dexterity and so much fluidity. The equipment on film cameras is also quite difficult to explain because they're not light work either. Mm. But the, the, the fluidity of camera movements influenced me a lot by me studying film mm. and watching lots of movies. And I decided I wanted to do the same with my cameras in the studio doing Doctor Who mm. and uh, to try and establish some kind of style. Mm. And I suppose and now if you were shooting TV, you'd be on, on the floor with, with the actors back then you were in the, in the gallery. I suppose you had to be a bit removed because you had four cameras, otherwise you would probably lose the sense That's of what's... Right. I was working, as you say, from a control room, quite separate from the actors, mm. and communicating through my personal assistant, mm. who would then convey my thoughts to the actors, mm. who would have been rehearsing with me in the past, before we shot. But now, of course, I would be on the floor with a with a with the single camera technique, mm. and able to explain what my thoughts are in person. In mm. those days, you couldn't do it in person. It was all detached. Mm. Yeah. And what did you think of some of the, the, the things that would also become iconic to Doctor Who, the, the TARDIS set, for example? Did you, I got, the, I, for my research, I don't think you were that impressed originally. Sorry, what? what oh, questions? when you saw the, uh, the TARDIS set, did you quite like it? Or what was your impression when you? Uh, well. I think it's quite kind of already known what happened with the TARDIS set. Mm. Uh, it was ill-prepared prior to our, op our very first recording. Mm. And um, I think the designer had to cobble it together as quickly as he could. It became yeah. a sort of hexagonal drawing brought mm. to life. Mm. And interestingly enough, that, that pressured him into a, a decision to, to create something that now has become kind of iconic and mm. has developed into something quite fascinating. Mm. The original set was, people used to laugh at us because they all said it was a bit like a cardboard set and it wasn't really, mm. but we tried to make it look as convincing as possible. Um, this followed up because let's, let's not forget that the budget was very tight on our shows. Mm. We have practically working with no money at all. But when it became such a success after the Daleks, um, the budget increased. And I'm very proud to say that the Marco Polo episodes that I did, which took us back into historical past, this was to teach kids about what it meant to travel from Europe to Cathay, which was China. Mm. Um, this was an educational part of the entertainment, uh, historically. Um, by the time we did the Marco Polo episodes, the budget had increased. And all you have to do is look at some of the stills. Unfortunately, the show is missing. Mm. No one can quite find it. I'm very proud of it, by the way. Mm. It's got an epic quality to it. We did sandstorms in the studio, which is amazing because mm. we didn't have any sand. But we used electronic equipment to uh, to to use on the screen, which in a funny way blurred according to the way we wanted it to. Mm. And it's a trick that we managed to manufacture with our own skills. Anyway, going back to budgets, it just shows that if you've got enough to play with, you can be more ambitious. Mm. And uh, the doc and the uh, doctor who episodes regarding Marco Polo are amazing because mm. there's, there's a scene when they finally arrive at the court with the great Khan in Peking, in Beijing, uh, in Cathay, sets are remarkable. They took up the whole side of a studio, which was shot. It, it, the studio itself was quite crude. Uh, in, uh, it was not at the television center, I might add. Hmm. Um, studio D Lime Grove was not quite the ideal studio no, for what no. we were trying to do. 
Mm. And if you look at the show now, it's amazing to think of the world we created there. Mm. Oh, it required yeah. a lot of imagination. Mm. And I had a wonderful designer, yeah. Barry New Newbury. Mm. But anyway, I, I don't want to take all the credit because designers in this case are and were very important. They sat down and looked at the script with you and we decided how we would shoot it and how we could make it most effective. Because don't forget, television is a small screen compared to the big one on the cinema. Mm. And you can, detailing of that is, it can be de dealt with. You, it, um, one of my designers said to me, Warris, don't forget, you're dealing with a world of illusion. And of course, that's what it was. We're creating an illusion that will make the audience believe what they're watching. Mm. And you needed to know where your camera is going to be shooting and what you're going to be looking at. Mm. So I would say, make that significant, make that set more important. Put more details there because I'm going to see it more. Forget what's going to be behind me because you won't see what's behind me. Mm. So spend more money in what I'm going to see. That's how we used to work. Designer myself as a unit. unit. So I don't want to take all the credit for myself. Mm. I want to give credit to the creative people who helped me. Mm. And of course, yeah. um, oh, oh, sorry, go on, Lois. Oh, I, I was going to say, um, you were talking about creative people around you. Of course, you had some fantastic people, um, no more so than Verity Lambert. How was your relationship oh. with her and, and what she brought to it all? Well, we're going to talk about Verity, who is my producer. Hmm. Now, it's a producer's job to find the right material in the right script and whether it's possible to put on camera. Hmm. And that's what she did. She worked within her budgets. She would look at the script and say, no, this scene is too extravagant. We can't afford to do it. Or this one we can do. Can you do a sandstorm in Studio D, Lima Grove? And I thought I did. I, I expressed a lot of doubt. Mm. And we got uh, uh, technical people and said, can you uh, do something electronic with the image to, to show as if there's sand in the spring? We use fans on the side. To, so that people's clothes would be shown to be blown away by wind. Mm. And then we interfered on the screen electronically and uh, emulated, or sorry, simulated what could be a sand storm. Mm. And that was to do with Verity and me sitting down and working out whether it's possible to do it. And once we worked it out, we put it into the script. This was during the Marco Polo expedition across the Gobi Desert hmm. in the script. Um, producers are very important because they have to be, they have to trust the director they've chosen. Hmm. And um, we would have a lot of discussion. And I think today people tend to forget what that's all about. Discussion is very important. Uh, well, what is possible and what isn't? Let's talk about how much money is available and let's talk about budgets. I'm used to working with budgets and that's something I'm proud of. I don't think I've ever overspent. Hmm. Um, that was what I was probably known for, the economy with which I shot and got through my shows on time. Hmm. On time is very important because time is money. Yeah. And we have to work with that economy mm. in thought, in our thoughts. Mm. Verity was a very practical person. She'd had a lot of experience as a BA. She knew what it meant to sit in the control room with a director and watch the monitors and the images that were on the, in front of you. Mm. She would also watch what I was shooting. And sometimes she'd see an image that I hadn't seen myself and say, you haven't seen what's on camera or you're concentrating on camera one, Warris, but look at camera four. There's an image there, I think you should use it. And we'd sit and work out how I could incorporate a, a, a man of shooting my, uh, 
shows. So in mm. many ways, she was constructive, I would say that. Um, I would add that we were both very unusual. She was the first female producer in drama at the BBC in television drama. Um, and uh, nobody quite knew what to make of her because women directors were unknown and indeed were, was someone like myself, uh, um, a British educated Indian born person, mm. sort of unusual, you might think. Uh, that wasn't something I bore on my shoulders thinking about all the time. But in retrospect, you have to think of me historically as an unusual factor. And the fact was, um, we were all unusual. Sidney Newman, who created it, was Canadian. Mm. Verity was a woman, and I was an Indian-born Brit. So I used to say, we're like the three musketeers. Mm. We're fighting the world. And we're doing it on our own terms. Mm. But it's about having that support, wasn't it? So sort of having three people that were kind of sort of unusual for the BBC at that time. You had each other's backs and it made it easy. Yes. Hmm. We were... Yes, I don't know. I, I think we've got to... I think you've got to describe yourself. Uh, we, we were actually breaking ground hmm. in our own way. Yeah. For which I'm very proud. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, uh, when you look at the the fir your first four part story, do you have particular scenes that are your favourite things that you think that really work really well, or little moments that might sort of stick out in your in your memory? Um, I think what I remember having to make sense of how you entered the telephone box, which became this huge space. Mm. Uh, it had to do with editing and we weren't allowed a lot of editing on tape. So I had to work out in my head when someone entered the TARDIS, what did it become like? All right, you stop tape, you repeat the action and reset. It was a total reset, but keep the energy going. Mm. I was always a bit concerned about the entry into the TARDIS mm. because the um, requirements seem to be so impossible. I, I think it does work re really well. Having had a look at look at it recently, it, it's you, you get sort of like a strange transition into the the ship, and then it's the pullback and I into think another dimension. Yes, very, and do you get that sense of of stepping over the threshold of something, something other is happening? Well, ideally, I would have liked to have had a continuous shot of them following them through. Hmm. But you see, it's impossible because the sets were totally separate. Hmm. The exterior of the Katardis was a separate set to hmm. the interior of the Tardis. Yeah. I couldn't do a continuous shot. Hmm. It's very frustrating. Hmm. Today, they would use steady cams and things. Yeah. But I don't know what they do. But we don't have the budget to go from A to B. Mm. Got to, you've got to go use them as separate entities. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you find that all actors quite like working as live, although recorded, but it was done as, as well, live? Well, most actors are used to this kind of thing because mm. of continuity problems. Mm. Uh, but it's up to the director to explain to them the energy factor with which they entered. They have got to remember what happened mm. when they entered the ship. Yeah. from outside and now they get inside mm. to express the kind of amazement that they experience mm. they have to act all that through yeah <laughs> I, I was just thinking about some of the actors that played the the, 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 the cave the cavemen and um the, the the main the main leader jeremy young plays cal of course uh, an actor went on to do a lot of uh, great work do you remember jeremy young at all i do remember jeremy and uh, he had a sense of humor uh, because we had to have a sense of humor where every time he got into those skins and started itching because there were fleas in the skin, um, uh, he'd laugh and say, Warris, I didn't train at drama school to be playing this role. And I said to Jeremy, I didn't train at university 
to be giving you monosyllabic dialogue. Mm. But this is what we're at. Mm. This is the challenge for me as a director and for you as an actor to make it work so that you are real to people watching you. Mm. And um, when he had to kill the character played by Derek Newart, mm. we have a story there where uh, they have this big fight. And he raises this rock and brings it down on um, mm. D D D Derek's head. And uh, Verity saw me standing around with a man. The pro prop man was holding a big melon mm. and a hammer. And she says, what's that about? I said, well, I'm using the melon as the skull and the hammer is going to hit it. And she said, well, it's off camera, isn't it? I said, yeah. She said, I don't want a squelch or a sound like that, Boris. But watching, this is for kids. I don't want a sound effect like that. It's too horrible. Mm. So we had a big argument. I said, look, you you said you've made me direct something that's savage, where people are killing each other. And yet you're worried about bloodshed. I said, this is a contradiction in terms. We had a big argument at the control room. She said, I don't want that sound effect. I said, well, I'm going to have it standing by. She said, no, you're not going to have it standing by because we're going to use it if you do. And I don't want that sound effect mm. of a hammer squelching into a, uh, into a pumpkin. Mm. So we did not use the sound because Verity, as a strong producer, persuaded me not to use it. I, I, I was not happy about the situation. But I gave in to it. And this is the result of the relationship one has with a producer. Mm. Um, she was right in many ways, because I'm not sure what that sound effect would have affected. It would have, it would have actually got to be children's imaginations mm. and been pretty ghastly. The whole idea of a, a, a huge rock coming down on someone is bad enough mm. without, you know, coloring it too much. So this is what we had to deal with. Yeah, and I, I think it's because it's all played on on Jacqueline Hill's reaction, and yes. I, I think that works. You know, but certainly just as well as say hearing the because it's left it's left to the imagination. It almost makes it worse. Well, you played on the result of the person watching the horror. Mm. Yeah, and that's what I believe in. I believe if you're going to do violence, I'd rather not show violence, and I'd like to imply it. Mm. Because it's in the imagination of the viewer mm. of what they may or may not have seen. Yeah. And you play it off people who witness it on camera. Mm. As you've just pointed out in, in, in our script, it's Jackie's, Jackie Hill's reaction, mm. Barbara's reaction. Yeah. Um, I think it's the same when the old woman gets killed as well by um, Derek Newitt's character. Again, very, for, for a children's TV show, you know, very, very striking. But again, it's done in a way that does, again, leave it a bit to the imagination. You see it. Exactly. You kind of see it, yeah. I mean, killing an old woman is no joke. No. Not in anybody's book, I don't think. And mm. the fact that she's in 10,000 years ago mm. is no excuse. <laughs> So, mm. I mean, I had to watch myself because the savagery of these people who lived at the time, because they were savage. Mm. I said, look, they have to eat each other to survive and they have to be warm by, by setting things on fire, finding fire. One mm. had to be realistic about certain things. And I did not want to be laughed at because I kept quoting Raquel Welsh. Mm. And I was joking about her. Hmm. Um, anyway, so we I think we managed to get away with it. And the first uh, four episodes, which is what I was involved with, hmm. um, tell the story fairly well hmm. within the framework of what we were doing. And I think, because again, the, the story centers around the, the, the four main characters, it, it is sort of... That it's about them, it's their story, it's about their connections, their escaping, their fears, etc. So, in some respects, the story around it could kind of be anything, really. You identify, you, you, you're allowed to identify because of the four main characters. Mm. Yeah. Because you're on their side mm. and you're fighting the, 
the antagonists the, the elsewhere. Mm. Anyway. And, and of, course, of course, they have brilliant chemistry. So perhaps it's a good chance to sort of talk about the uh, the actors. I mean, Jack, Jacqueline Hill, for instance, what was, what was Jacqueline like to uh, to work with? Well, she was wonderful to work with. I think the whole thing is you've got to understand when we went into this show, mm. nobody quite knew that it was going to last. Mm. And um, I think they thought of it as a bit of a joke. Where mm. are we now? Where is it going to go? And we all had a bit of a, it, was, it wasn't intense at all. We didn't get all very wound up because we did not know where we were going, actually. So I'm able to say that now at this distance. Hmm. I had no idea what we had in our hands. Hmm. I think that's the same of any long running show, isn't it? With, with Star Trek, for instance, you have a, a huge mythology well, well, now, but it was all kind of sort of made up a little well, bit. They, I, I have a sense that I hope I'm not uh, I hope I'm wrong. I have a feeling Star Trek got its initiation from Doctor Who initially. I mean, it sort of followed on, hmm. but it didn't have the magic of transformation from someone changing from one A to something else. Hmm. But Star Trek would have much more money behind it. It was hmm. a Hollywood yeah. drama. Hmm. And we've now been alive and around for God knows how many years. We're celebrating, I think, our 60th year. Yes, it's 60 years, and um, it's, it's. I think Doctor Who's still in pretty good good shape, and it's now a, a co-production with Disney, so that's interesting in itself. And, Indeed. Um, and now you can see I've grayed up. I was 20-something. <laughs> I was a young yeah. kid when I started. Hmm. I mean, when did you get the sense that this show was, was had had some some was it? I suppose when the Daleks came in, that kind of increased the popularity of it. But when did you sort of well, think this is something that's really going to last? I, I I wish I'd been a part of the Dalek creation. Mm. I wasn't. I think I had to persuade myself by saying um, I have to I have to persuade myself by saying I set the tone for the show, mm. and the Daleks followed on. Mm. Because it was the Daleks that set the show going into mm. into the stratosphere. Mm. I, I wish I'd been a part of it. And and you've always been very interested. Well, of course, being um, studying Shakespeare at university and uh, etc. You've always been interested in sort of um, uh, sort of his, historical pieces. Um, so I suppose it was kind of uh, was it. I take being a staff writer at the BBC, you you were assigned shows as you were with, with an early child. But when it came to Marco Polo doing a, doing a, again a yeah. show in the past, that was kind of again just a coincidence. Yeah, a period piece. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, it was a relief to be doing Marco Polo actually, hmm. because I wasn't dealing with science fiction as yeah. such. Hmm. It was the historical past, and John Lucarotti, who scripted it, did a lot of research into mm. his script, which is full of information. If you actually look at the show, mm. uh, if you're watching it, you get educated through it. Because the initial idea for Doctor Who from Sydney was that the past should influence the future. And uh, we should educate kids mm. uh, historically. So that's why some of the stories went into the past and mm. things like the French Revolution. Mm. They dealt with things like that, hmm. or ancient Rome. Hmm. But it was to do with the fact that you were educating kids. I think, in a way, I'm sad that that, in many ways, it got lost. Yes. Hmm. We're not education. We're not educating anyone anymore. Yeah. We're playing with science fiction, hmm. which is okay too, because that's what's entertaining, hmm. on the Star Trek level. Um, but if it could only go back to some kind of past and deal with what people had to live through and our protagonists have to experience, mm. that might educate it, that might educate kids. Yeah, I, I entirely agree. I mean, I mean, of course, Doctor Who does go in, into, into in the past still fairly often, but there's always a science fiction elements is always a monster or just trying to change time. Yes, I thought that was 
Mm. Unfortunately, that to me was an unnecessary yeah. distraction. Mm. Because monsters work as a form of entertainment. Yeah. There's no solution to them. Mm. They ultimately have to dissolve and disappear. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the only solution to them. Mm. Um, I'm not sure what the future is going to bring, but it'll be fascinating. Mm. I'm mean, saying it would be nice to return to, say, a couple of pure historicals, just interacting with, with figures like Marco Polo and, and then sort of going off again. I, that's one thing that, as a fan of the old Doctor Who as well as the new, as I do miss those, it's almost when the monster turns up in Pompeii, for example, it's like, oh, well, you know, yeah, yeah. it kind of takes <laughs> a bit of, you, at least yes. learning a bit, because they do give you certain information about, so, so kids, I think, can still learn from it, but not in the same way as they could, say, by watching uh, Marco Polo, of course. Um, I just want yeah. to, well, on Marco Polo, um, do you remember um, Mark, Mark Eden, who played Marco Polo? I do remember Mark. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd worked with Mark initially in a play I'd done before mm. called The Shadow of Mart, in which he played the lead, and he was very good. And so when we were casting Mark Polo, I said, we need a hero in the conventional sense, a square-jawed character, you know, which is what he was. Um, Mark was a very good-looking guy, and he, he, he sort of looked to me like, the sort of actor that Hollywood would cast. Mm. And you need someone like that in the lead. Mm. And, and opposite, of course, it had a great villain, uh, Darren, ne Darren Nesbitt, as Darren the Nesbitt, protagonist. <laughs> who I've seen in a number of movies playing villains. He always mm. played villains, but he loved doing that. Yeah. It, it sort of gave him a lot of energy and energized him. Mm. Um, he was actually a very kind, nice person outside mm. of this. But working with him, I, I have to say, I felt a sense of awe in 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 encouraging his evil elements. Mm. <laughs> but he did a very good job, I thought. Oh yeah, yeah, and you say he was somebody that, that has played a lot of villains in his his career, and I think it's a part that, from what you can, if by listening to the audio or seeing the telly snaps, you do get a sense that he relished the role and brought a lot a lot to it. Um. Uh, so, so of course you I did two Doctor Who stories. I'd say after after then your career just kind of took you away from that the BBC and you went on to other other things. Would you have liked to have come back to Doctor Who at some point in, in um, your career? Well, there was a time when they were thinking of bringing me back, hmm. and uh, I would have liked to have done that. Hmm. I would have liked to have worked for Russell T Davis, hmm. who I admire enormously. Hmm. I, I admire his imagination and his storytelling. Yeah. But funny enough, they never asked me back. Oh. And, I, and I felt <laughs> shortchanged on the basis of that. Hmm. Never being asked back. I never quite understood why. Yeah. I think it's partly because I'd gone into higher realms of drama. Right. Yeah. And historical dramas by then. I'd also broken away from television and done couple of features hmm. they probably thought I was too grand and I wasn't really hmm. I should have made it clear to them I wasn't hmm. but anyway there we are hmm. uh, yeah I missed not having gone back hmm. so I think only Graham Harper is the only director that, that straddled the two the two eras he did a couple of but but Graham Harper stayed from I think very much did TV work whereas of course you as you say you went on to different uh, directions. Um, I think there was a rumour that um, John Nathan Turner might have wanted you for the 20th anniversary story at some point. Uh, well, but there was, you know, I, I didn't know John Nathan Turner very well because at the time he was producing, I was in America. Hmm. I was, I had now started, I'd now established myself in the world of commercial American television. Uh, so I don't think it would have been easy for him to get me out of there mm. because by that time I was addicted to working on television, uh, American television drama. Yeah. Um, so I never really worked with him. Mm. Um, there were other producers I would have liked to work for, but mm. as I said, America came in between me and continuing with Doctor Who. Mm. 
So, so, so was it an, an offer you got from America or did you consciously want to go and... Well, uh, I, I'd gone into dramas here. Uh, some shows I did, like The Glittering Prizes by Frederick Raphael, by graduates from uh, university and their lives, uh, subsequent lives. It was a show that I was very proud of. It introduced Tom Conti to the world of television. Mm. Um, in America, producers saw my work and because they saw and they liked what they saw, they invited me to come over. I did not go over looking for a job. So I got a job offer from the States and uh, I flew out there not knowing what I was in for. And that was my introduction to the world of American TV, which is quite different. Mm. It's based very much on audience for, uh, numbers. Yeah. Uh, and um, everything depends on, uh, on, on, on actual numbers and, and on the number of audiences, mm. audience figures. Yeah. As it does anywhere, but over there it's critical. And I found myself in a very competitive world, mm. but you know, you have to get used to these things. And I had to sort of educate myself into the way of working in American television. Mm. Uh, you shoot a two hour movie in about 18 days. And there you work on 35 mil cameras as you do on features mm. with film crews. So to shoot something in 18 days is unknown. Feature films take up to four months to shoot. Mm. And I had to get used to the fact that that was not the case in my situation. Mm. But, but again, working very quickly with the BBC would have been a really good yes. you know, point would... to, work, to work quickly and economically. Yes. I, I came back here to do a drama set in England for American television. Is based on a bestseller by Rosamund Pilcher called uh, The Shell Seekers. Mm. So they, they took classic books and dramatized them. And this was a four parter, two hours for two nights, with Angela Lansbury. Mm. And we shot it just as a feature film. A lovely cast Sam Wanamaker, Angela Lansbury, and um, Patricia Hodge to name but a few. <laughs> mm. And uh, it allowed me the scope of working with well-established figures in the film world. Mm. Um, but before then, I mustn't forget that I had already done some quite significant television in Britain. I'd graduated from things like the Glittering Prizes. I did a drama based on the abdication, Edward and Mrs. Simpson. Mm. which is quite relevant today, I would think. Oh, and So, man marries an American divorcee and gives up his royal position. Mm. But um, um, it meant a lot of research and getting things right. And that was for Verity Lambert at Thames TV. I'd left BBC by then and become a freelance. Mm. So th that was my experience in the world of commercial BB, uh, ITV. Hmm. It is also based on audience numbers, unlike the BBC. Hmm. It is also, it would like, I know the BBC would like to have audience numbers, but it doesn't exist on that level, on that commercial level. Hmm. So, um, you know, Edward, and, Edward and Mr. Simpson, uh, through Verity, allowed me to open up, and I, and I won an, uh, an Emmy for it of which I'm very proud, mm. and a BAFTA. Mm. Anyway, um, I was able to expand, let's put it this way. Mm. I, I mean, I think Edward and Mrs. Mr. Simpson was a wonderful series, and it was something that I watched, um, I think, when I was at, at a secondary school, and I did um, uh, a, 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 a quite a significant bit of coursework about Ed, um, Edward because I was the fascination grew from, from from your your series so so i've always uh, enjoyed that as a, as a as a serial well now of course well i'm happy you did that i'm happy you enjoyed it yeah. uh, i'm very proud of it because in many ways 
we were way ahead of the crown. The crown yes. is telling the same story, mm. but with much more money involved, <laughs> very elaborate. Mm. Ours was done on budgets, again, watching what we did and how we did it. Mm. And I had a wonderful cast. I had Edward Fox's, um, Edward VIII. Mm. He was wonderful. Yeah. And Cynthia Harris as Wallace. I think she was almost like a double, a doppelganger of the real person, mm. which was an achievement in itself. Um, so uh, that took me into other areas of my television experience. I mean, Ed, Edward Fox has been somebody I've, because I'm a big theatre fan, and I've seen him on stage, uh, you know, on a few occasions, and he always, of course, fantastic performer, a very unique way of delivering uh, dialogue and and a lovely person as well. He always comes out and meets meets people off afterwards at the stage door. So. Uh, so I take it he was quite a good actor too. To, 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 to wonderful work. actor, a wonderful person to work with. Hmm. Uh, I'll never forget, he did the abdication speech, which had to literally copy the speech made by Edward VIII, declaring the fact he was giving up the throne for the woman he loved. And Edward learned every inch of that speech the nuance that he gave it, he actually listened to the recording and repeated it and played it. Hmm. He didn't have anything to read with. I remember taking it, we did it all in one take. Hmm. Brilliant. Hmm. That was how conscientious Edward is. Yeah. And capable of, of delivering. Hmm. And you did have Patrick Troughton in, in, in that serial as, as, as well. So do you remember yes. much about Patrick? Yes, indeed. He played Clement Attlee. Mm. Shaved his head for it mm. to be bald. Talk about acting, you know, um, actor's workshop. Yes, no, no, Patrick. Mm. Lovely person to work with. Mm. And, I've uh, been very fortunate with the actors I've worked with. Mm. Never had anybody that really gave me a problem. Do you have a favourite actor that that's, that you've always liked or always wanted to to use? Well, I would say actresses. Hmm. I've worked. I did the Suffragette series about the Bankhurst score shoulder to shoulder, uh, and Sean Phillips played Emmeline Bankhurst quite beautifully. Hmm. She looked physically like Emmeline. She was taller. But I work with Sean, but the people I really worked with and I've had the privilege of working with was Virginia McKenna, who I worked with in A Passage to India. Mm -hmm. uh, she personified the character of Adela Quested, as written by Forster, and gave it a, a, a truth that I've never seen anywhere else. Mm. So uh, we became very good friends. I'm happy to say that I've become good friends with people like Virginia McKenna and Sean Phillips, and also Francesca Annis, hmm. who I directed in a, a, it was a British version of the German Weimar Republic film, Mädchen in Uniform, Girls in Uniform. Unfortunately, these have all been wiped because hmm. they all tell a story about people in certain circumstances that are relevant not only to them but to now so but mm. i'm proud of some of the work i did mm. and uh, if you notice my list of um, favorites are all ladies mm. I, I i think i work better with with women than i do with men i'm mm. not saying i'm not giving a reason for that but it's just you, just from your, from the experiences you've had, those yes. are the relationships that have been. Uh, women are much more uh, uh, adaptable and, uh, and they, they absorb more. Mm. There's no resistance involved in the fact they're being told mm. what to do. I think yeah. men don't like being told what to do. Mm. Yes, yes. Um, and I suppose it also it, does it also depend a little bit on how established an actor or an actress is in terms of how fluid they are, you know, how much you can mould them. 
Hmm. Yes. Um, I, I believe you were quite instrumental in Caroline, uh, Caroline Ford being cast as, as Susan. Is, is that correct? Yes. Uh, th th that's a story I tell often. Hmm. Uh, I, I watched her on a monitor from an observation room at the BBC hmm. when she was doing another drama. I watched her on monitor just larking about, not acting, but just being herself. Hmm. And I thought there was something about her. Hmm. And I, I, I was in the same building as the observation room, obviously, television center. And I called up my, to my office where Verity was. I said, come and have a look at this girl on the monitor. What do you think of her for the Susan role? And Verity came down and watched. I think that's what hmm. uh, persuaded her to accept the fact that Carol could do it. Hmm. We didn't know at that time how old Carol was. She was not a teenager at the time. Hmm. Because we were looking for a young teenager, we were auditioning, lots of young girls, but they were all being very self-conscious. And the whole point about this character was that she shouldn't be self-conscious. She, mm. she, she should be odd in her behavior. And mm. that's what Carol played. Mm. She, she seems to be very confident as an actress as well. It, 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 of course, she's the youngest member of the of the four, so I guess everyone was kind of a bit protective of her because she was a bit younger. Was, was that fair? No, they, 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 they were very good with her. Hmm. There was no tension at all. Hmm. It was all very companionable. Well, they do have great chemistry. I mean, I, I suppose that's kind of sort of the luck of the gods when you get four people that yeah. work so well together. Um, yeah. Well, Carol's was... Uh, Sydney Newman was very much instrumental in the way he presented that character of Susan. And I had to change the way I did the pilot with her. Hmm. We did an initial pilot where I made her play much more strange. Hmm. And Sydney said, no, 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 I don't want her strange. I want her to be a teenage girl of the times hmm. in the early 60s. So I had to change that. And Carol was not happy. Hmm. She wanted to be straight, more strange. I give her credit for that thinking. Hmm. But Sydney didn't want her more strange, so I had to go with Sydney's thinking. Hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't looked at the pilot versus the first um, episode that was broadcast. She is, I think, much more strange and, in some respects, more interesting, although not as relatable, but you're kind of more intrigued by... Well, you've that. just said relatable. That's hmm. what Sydney wanted. Hmm. He wanted hmm. young kids to relate to her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... I think, I think probably that was maybe why she left so relatively quickly, just d done a year and, and that was it, probably because her character was watered down and, you know, even in this episode, she does a bit of bit of her famous screaming and I think maybe that was just kind of a classic damsel in distress and as an act and as a, an actress with some chops on them, you, you don't yes. really want to do that all the time, do you? I think she was tired of screaming, hmm. as were a lot of it. Alfred Hitchcock heroines. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so just for about the two male leads, so of course, William Russell is very much the sort of romantic, dashing hero um, yes. part of it. Um, and d d uh, quite quite well known, I think, by 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 this point, sort of various things he did in, in yeah. the 50s. Um, what, what was William like and also his relationship with William Hartnell? Uh, very uh, companionable. Because William Russell was a professional. Mm. He'd done so many things. He'd been mm. famous for television series. Mm. And he didn't want to sound as if he was standing in William Hartnell's way. Because mm. this was William's first television experience. He'd been used to doing a lot of feature films. Mm. And uh, I think everyone tolerated each other and helped each other. Mm. And of course, we have William Hartnell, again, a very established actor, you know, coming in into it. Um, how did you find William Hartnell? Because I think he was sometimes not the easiest to guy to work with, but always seemed to be very. Everyone seems to like to, to like him, though. He was quite. William was, uh, in many ways, he was an amusing person. But William Hartnell was an irascible person. Uh, he 
had his own way of expressing himself. I'll never forget, he was puzzled by me. He couldn't quite figure out who this young Indian speaking with an English, a posh English accent was. Mm. So on our first day of rehearsal, we had taped, we had uh, tapes on the floor indicating sets. And I said, William, I'd like you to walk from here to there. And he wanted to test me and say, oh, I don't think I want to walk there, Warris. I think I'd rather walk there. Now I had to deal with that because the test was coming up, according to William, because William was trying to test who this young whippersnapper was. Mm. And uh, I said, William, you're welcome to walk there if you want. The only trouble is I won't be able to cover you on my camera. So at the moment he knew there'd be no camera there, he changed tack and mm. agreed to be where I wanted him to be. So I passed the test. I learned very quickly to work with people like William and to pass the test. Mm. Never fight. Always say, oh, if that's what you would like to do, let's talk about it. Mm. The only problem is, then I bring up the problem, throw the ball in his court and ask him to solve the problem. Mm. And if he can't, then I'll solve it. Right, yeah. That's how William and I dealt with each other. Hmm. And so there's several stories have gone by by the time that you had finished this one and then went on to, to Marco Polo. Did you see think that the cast had, had, had gelled even more when, when you came back? Was it maybe that was why it was a better, a better experience? Well, they had, yes, they had gelled. And we had a new member of the cast, Xenia Merton, hmm. who was playing the young... Chinese girl Ping Cho. Mm. And Xenia was wonderful because she was a mixed race. She was half Malay and half English. But she was very conscious of who of joining a team. And Caroline and she got on very well. Mm. They're very generous with her. So the show itself was a pleasure to work on. Mm. And um, did you think that anything was kind of, you kind of mentioned that Susan's character was a bit watered down from the pilot to the to the broadcast version. The Doctor was also, I think, more sort of, with a bad tempered, I think, so I think that, did you prefer that though? Would you have liked to have kept those elements? Well, the thing about uh, the character was we kept him as being a bit of a contradiction in terms, I mean, we had some, you never quite knew where he was going to be going next. Hmm. Would he would, would he help others when it meant saving himself or not? Hmm. And there was something erratic about him. And I wish there was a bit more of that now. Hmm. Uh, at the moment, he's not vulnerable enough. Um, so, you know, unpredictable. I'd like him to be more unpredictable. Hmm. I suppose you, even if you look at some of the episodes with, with the with the K people, and there's one where the Jeremy Young's character gets mauled by the, the bear, and the Doctor is kind of thinking, "Oh, we shouldn't in, in, interfere," and so he becomes a bit less relatable as he should be, being an alien, and everyone else is being very human and helping out. And I think he even grabs a a, a, a rock that Ian sees him take, and you think, "Well, what was he going to do with that?" and so there, there is still, I think, this... Exactly, the ambivalence. Yes. Well, how is he going to deal with it? Mm. Yeah. 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 Mm. And um, I should mention that, that um, in 2013, the 50th anniversary of, of Doctor Who, there was the Adventures in Space and Time doc docudrama. And, of course, it was... What was that like to, to, to see? Because it was, of course, your your story, Verity's story, etc. Were, were you happy with that? Well, I had to uh, fill in certain details with Mark Geddes, who wrote the script, hmm. uh, because uh, he, he, you know, in his original script, Verity Lambert was an anxious PA looking for a job uh, and living in a flat in, a, in Bayswater. In those days, Bayswater was not a place where you lived in a basement flat. 
I mm. said, Mark, you have to understand, Verity did not come. She did not need to live in a basement flat. In fact, she lived in Eaton News House off of Eaton Square, because Verity herself was a well, a well-educated, well-off lady. She didn't need the job. We needed to say that in the script, mm. and he had her traveling in a bus in the script. I said, Mark, she never traveled in a bus. She had her own car. Mm. And Mark said, I want her in a bus because I want her to gauge the temperature of the crowd reaction to the Daleks. So he wrote a scene in. It was very clever in the way he incorporated Verity on the bus because he has my character saying, oh, so you're traveling by bus now, are you? And she then laughs and says, no, no, I needed to find out how they reacted to the Daleks. Um, so it was Mark using his ingenuity as a writer to right. incorporate some of the realities of who Verity was, and indeed who, Ver who uh, my character was. Hmm. I mean, I had to get my character kind of straightened out with Mark. And I think he did a fairly good job. Hmm. And of course, Sasha Dewan plays, plays yes. you have gone on to fantastic things, including playing the master in the newer episodes of Doctor Who. Were you happy with yes. Sasha's portrayal of you? I thought he did very well, considering hmm. the limitations he was faced with. And hmm. I thought Sasha did very well. Hmm. And um, so, uh, what else I wanted to ask you? Uh, so, when of course you were d doing, um, uh, I mean, do, do, you've done obviously um, TV on videotape, TV on 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 film, TV movies, feature films. Do you have a a, a, a preference in terms of the, the the medium that you work with, or does it all kind of have its own appeal? Well, I I I I, I love working in television. I love working in the medium, but if you were to ask me what I would prefer to do, mm. I would like to end up doing a feature film again. Mm. Yeah. I mean, did, did you ever do do theatre? Was that kind of not, not something that ever? Kind yes, of, I have. You have, yeah. Ironically, I did a play at the National Theatre with John Gilgood. Ah, right. Called uh, Half Life, mm. and it's now being done on stage. Mark Gattis is playing. John Gilgood in the play, mm. which is on at the National, and uh, I hope to go and see him in it. Yeah. But um, you know, I've done plays at the National, the transfer to the Duke of York's. I, I, when I was a student at university, I directed Shaw's Seas and Cleopatra, which transferred from Cambridge to the Duke of, uh, Duke of York's, sorry, the Duchess Theatre in London. Mm. So I've had theatre experience, and in New in America I directed Edith Wharton's The House of Mirth at the Long Wharf Theatre in New Haven. Mm. So I love theatre. I'd love to do more, mm. but I don't seem to be seen as a theatre director by mm. producers out there. <laughs> um, would would you say that the the industry is one of those where you do get a bit pigeonholed into uh, well, you the, do, you get, um, yes, I would say that mm. they don't they don't really. Uh, it's very competitive business, you see, that people are sort of nudging each other to get a position, and mm. you know nothing is cut and dried, nothing is generous. Mm. Uh, you know there are people out there who know what one can actually do. It's a question of dare they, do they dare use you at the cost of potential success or failure? Hmm. Everyone wor wor worries about success in the business, I'm afraid. Yeah. That's something, touch wood, I never thought about at the time. Hmm. And do you think that aspect of it has, has gotten worse? Do you think it's become more cautious industry? Uh, well, theatre is no longer cheap to go to. It's no. an expensive proposition. Mm. I don't think, uh, I don't blame people for, it's like playing, it's like a crapshoot. You hope it turns up sixes. There are no mm. guarantees. So I don't blame them for being nervous. Mm. 
but I wish they would have a little bit more open-minded about it. Hmm. So, hmm. but I think also your name does carry a, a, a quite a bit of weight, and that you know people know people know who, who you are. So if you were kind of attach or direct something, I think that would you know be a a, a positive. Well, I, I, I wish that was the case. Hmm. I don't know that uh, that's possible. Hmm. Hmm. I would love to be able to take something to a theatre and say, let me do this, but then I have to find the right material. Oh, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. without the right material, I don't think I can push myself. Oh, yeah, it's, it's finding what you want to, what's going to, you know, to take you through that, that journey. Did you ever encounter Laurence, Laurence Olivier? I did. I work with Laurence Olivier. He did a series for Granada TV called Laurence Olivier Presents. Hmm. And uh, he asked me to direct, I directed uh, Daphne Laureola mm. with Joan Plowright playing opposite him, based on a very successful West End play starring Edith Evans in those days in the 50s. Mm. And La Laurence Olivier appeared in it. He produced it then. He acted in my TV show. Mm. And it was a huge privilege working with him. Mm -hmm. on a play that he'd originally produced in the West End. Yeah. And Joan played the Edith Evans role. I got to work with both of them very well. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose I should include Joan in my repertoire of ladies because I've, I've got to know her quite well. Mm -hmm. And it was a privilege. Mm -hmm. I did end up uh, doing a film with her and Jean Moreau and um, a play called um, The Clothes in the Wardrobe. Hmm. Uh, it ended up in America called The Summer House with Lena Headey in the lead. Um, yeah, it was a, a lovely cast actually. But anyway, so um, again, I had a proliferation of female leads in it, mm. and they didn't end up as all my favorite things. <laughs> Although I did end up having dinner with a lot of them later. Mm. But uh, and Lena Headey became very famous. Um, anyway, um, that was a film I forgot. I should not forget that film. Mm but it was worth doing. Yeah. Um, I, I've had a lot of people talk about Laurence Olivier in the past, but not so many about, about John Gilgood. Do you have any particular memories of John Gilgood? Well, I was directing one of the great theatre greats hmm. and working on stage with him. He kept saying, Warris, dear, don't forget this is the stage, not a TV camera, because hmm. I was pushing people into little knots and mm. not spreading them over the space that was necessary. Mm. And he would tell me to open it up more, which is his way of helping me direct. Yeah. But otherwise, as an actor, he listened to what I was saying. Mm. I was very fond of him. Mm. Uh, one thing you do sometimes see when you watch um, BBC serials uh, is sometimes you, they have actors that are quite used to being on the stage and they don't always necessarily adjust their performance to TV. It's sometimes a bit, have you ever encountered that right. issue? I, I agree with you, absolutely. Mm. They need to uh, bring it down and tighten it up mm. and become quieter. Uh, I forgot to tell you, I, I work with John Keelgood as the Inquisitor in my production of Shaw's St. Joan, mm. which I did with Janet Susman who I should also incorporate into my ladies' group. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Janet, Jan, Janet played St. Joan wonderfully. And uh, John Kilgood played the Inquisitor. Hmm. So I got to know both of them very well. Hmm. Um, again, have a look at your, your CV. It's, it's very difficult to know what not to ask about because, of course, there's so much. Um, just to finish off, there's just a couple of projects I thought might be worth sort of asking you about. Um, a, a Touch of Love, 1969, that was um, Sandy Davis and Ian McKellen. Sandy Dennis. Yeah, Sandy, Sandy Dennis. Dennis. Yes, yes. And uh, Ian McKellen. Mm. That was Ian McKellen's first ever film. Mm. Little did we know who would end up as he is now. Yeah. 
Um, when I when I was directing it, I asked Ian to play the lead opposite uh, Sandy Dennis, who, by the way, her presence helped finance the picture because she'd been nominated for an Oscar and, uh, with her performance in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Hmm. Uh, because she was nominated, we were in a position to be able to finance the picture on her name. And hmm. that's how we got the film made. And she had to play an uh, uh, upper middle class British girl. Here was an all American actress playing an upper middle class British girl, hmm. hardly likable or possible. Hmm. And she did it beautifully. Hmm. Um, it was based on a novel by Margaret Travel, a novel called The Millstone. In our film, the film was called The Touch of Love. And it's about a woman who decides to bring up a child as a single parent. In the 60s, you didn't do that. Mm. You just couldn't be a single parent mother. It was all frowned upon. And she decided to play that role because of that role, mm. fighting the system. And it's critical of the NHS as well, where girls are treated very strangely. Hmm. Um, Ian played the unknowing father. Um, and he's quite wonderful in it. Hmm. Uh, did I'd, you known Ian, I'd known Ian at Cambridge. Oh, right. So, so you have that good relationship with... And, uh, with yes, I, I'd, I'd worked with Ian. In the past. I directed him as, in Twelfth Night, in which he played Toby, Toby Belch. Ah. He's absolutely hmm. wonderful. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I've seen him on on stage a few times as well. Um, uh, King Lear a couple of years ago, and yeah, yeah there's something very mesmerising and, and special about um, Ian McKellen. Um, uh, again, going back to period pieces, uh, Henry the Eighth and his six wives. You've got Donald Pleasance, Michael Goff, all sorts of people in that one. Yes, I had wonderful. Uh, time directing historical drama because of course I'm obsessed by as a lot of people are by the Tudors hmm. uh, I remember at school doing making little plastine plasticine figurines of Tudor people um, what happened was that the TV series was such a hit they wanted to make a feature of it hmm. and they asked me to do it and I said no I didn't want to do a copy of the TV series and I would only do it if, in one hour, you have to tell the story of a man with six wives. Hmm. Uh, how are you going to do it? So I, I worked with a writer called Ian Thorne, who'd done one of the original dramas from the BBC. And he and I sat down and I said, Ian, how do we justify a, a, a two-hour movie about Henry VIII when it's been done so many times? Hmm. And Keith Michel had been a brilliant Henry. He was the only person still appointed to the role. I said, we've got to do a film that makes sense, otherwise don't make it at all. Mm. You know, the cliche is a big fat man eating chicken legs, throwing them over his shoulder. This is not Henry VIII. Mm. Let's, let's look into him. And Ian came up with the brilliant idea that Henry VIII was who he was because he himself was he, he, full of self-doubt. Um, a man who felt betrayed by God. Hmm. Um, why else did his first wife have so many male children? Catherine of Aragon hmm. gave birth to stillborn babies. They never had a male child in there. He felt himself cursed. Mm. He felt that the world was against him and the world surrounding him. So what he did, uh, what Ian did was to do a movie about a man who didn't trust anyone, let, 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 less of all himself. And therefore, the big excuse was to find betrayal in everybody. Mm. Um, people like Thomas More, who he trusted enormously, he felt betrayed by Thomas More, who did not agree 
about the whole idea of the divorce. He felt betrayed by, if he didn't feel someone had betrayed him, he'd create betrayal, as he did with Anne Boleyn. Mm. Um, Catherine Howard, who was the youngest wife, did betray him with someone else. She slept with someone else. But he felt that he would be betrayed throughout. So the curse of what, uh, you know, when a man feels like that, in reality, historically, mm. you don't have to be Henry VIII. You have to be someone who's full of doubt and dangerous as a result. Mm. And we, we created that character because of that. And we worked on the film because of that. Hmm. Uh, Alan, do you remember uh, working with, with Donald Pleasance um, on, on that one? Yes. Hmm. I, I worked with Donald Pleasance a number of times. Ple a wonderful person to work with. Hmm. Uh, um, I did a film with him called... Um, uh, Arch of Triumph with Anthony Hopkins mm. in which Donald played a Nazi, ex-Nazi who was responsible for torturing the character that Anthony Hopkins played. And it, it was made earlier on as a film with Charles Norton in the role. Mm. Uh, it ends up with the main character murdering the Nazi uh, as a form of revenge. Mm. And Donald had that wonderful way of playing devious characters. Yes. Mm. You never quite knew when he was going to turn around and hit you. But um, anyway, he played uh, Thomas Cromwell mm. and he played the Nazi. Mm. So uh, I've had the pleasure of working with some very good people. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just mentioned Anthony Hopkins there. I mean, of course, you know, just, you know. Uh, uh, just amazing person. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Anthony has the quality of inner brooding, hmm. a lot of um, personal angst, which yeah. is expressed in his performances. Hmm. And um, well, one person in, in that cast that, of course, Doctor Who fans would be familiar with is is Michael Goff. Do you remember Michael Goff? I worked with Michael Goff a number of times. Hmm. He played uh, the Duke of Norfolk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Henry VIII, hmm. and then I worked with him in the Shell Seekers, again playing an, a, a very well known art dealer opposite Angela Lansbury. Hmm. A pleasure again to work with, as always. Hmm. I, I did see Angela Lansbury. Um, she came over to to the West End and did was it Life Spirit? I think it was. Yes. And I think she was ninety at the time, and she was running around the stage like you know. I mean, I couldn't do it as you know, person in 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 his thirties. You know, so amazing um, energy she she had, and you know, um, again, a very likable person as, as Great well. Great loss now. Mm. Yes. Mm. Um, there was one actor that, that you might not remember, uh, a guy called Peter Madden. He played Fisher in um, Henry VIII and the Six Wives. Do you remember Peter no, Madden? No. Um, that's okay. Um, of course, you had Brian Blessed in that as Suffolk, whether he had any sort of, when you have any last impressions of, of Brian Blessed at all. Who is this? Uh, oh, uh, Brian Blessed. Oh, Brian Blessed. Hmm. But Brian is himself, I mean, he's a wonderful character. Hmm. Is it larger than Larkin? played Bluff, uh, the Duke of Suffolk. Hmm. And um, I also directed him in a series about George Sand with Rosemary Harris. Hmm. Oh my goodness, another lady I should have mentioned, Rosemary yeah. Harris. Hmm. Um, he played um, a French poet, a bluff loud man <laughs> hmm. which is what brian is oh yeah 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 he's yeah he's lovely, lovely. Um, yes yeah, lo lovely lovely um a guy um again i've seen him do, do a one man show just him talking about his career and yeah he always comes across um rather wonderfully um you did o onassis the richest richest man in the world of course 
a period piece but again people would still kind of know who you were kind of talking about so is there a bit more of a responsibility when you're doing things that people are, are still around that the might people know are still around yes yeah yeah but you have to be careful when you're doing this because it means doing a lot of research and trying to find uh, a lot of it was based on the book and mm. of course i studied the book very carefully mm. um and i raul julia was cast by the network mm. they wanted a name from broadway Raoul was a wonderful actor, but he was physically totally wrong for Onassis. I had another actor in mind, mm. but the network would not accept him, even though subsequently the actor I had in mind became very famous. Anyway, Raoul played it. And I had my, uh, you know, when you're working for American television, it's very hard. You can never tell them who you really want mm. because they're dictated to by the, te the television audience appreciation. Mm. And Ra Raoul played it beautifully, but he was physically six foot one. Mm. And Anassis was a short man. Yeah. And when men are short and rich and famous, sorry, they, they make up for a lot. Mm. Their shortcomings. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, so Raoul could hardly play that. Mm. Yeah. I couldn't work on him saying, Raoul, you've got a few problems here. Mm. You're, not, you're not short enough. <laughs> but um, mm. he played it beautifully. The, the dilemma of being a, a man whose father never appreciated him and being Greek mm. and having to make his way in the world mm. and being greedy. Mm and uh, ambitious for all the things that were necessary. Yeah. And I think mean, he had... Um... Uh, Jane Seymour played... Mm. Uh, she played uh, uh, Maria Callas. Mm. And I'm happy to say she won the Emmy as the Best Supporting Actress in her role. Mm. Anyway, um, she was cast before I had a choice of casting. I had a number of actresses who nearly killed me for not thinking of them for Maria Callas. Mm. But I couldn't explain that the network had said to me, you have to have Jane Seymour, who at that time was famous for Dr. Quinn, mm -hmm. the Edison woman. Yeah. Um, because her TVQ rating was very high. Mm. So I ended up with her and I had to be beg Francesca Annis to play um, Jackie Onassis, Jackie Kennedy. Mm. Um, she didn't want to do it, mm. but every American actress I offered it to mm. turned it down because the character was not a very nice person in the script. No. She was portrayed as a go-getting woman working under the guise of vulnerability after the death of her husband. Mm. And uh, we found out in the original script, in the book, that Onassis, having married her, wrote a divorce, wrote uh, on a piece of paper saying he wanted to divorce her within six months of the marriage. Mm. Because she was so extravagant. Right. He spent too much money on it, mm. on his count. And we had her being very, very greedy in the film, shopping and buying and doing things, mm. which Americans don't want to play. She's an icon in America. Mm. So most American actresses turned her down. Right. I had to persuade Francesca, who was a friend, to play Jackie. Just like last comment on, on Anassas, I did see Robert Lindsay play Anassas on in, on stage. And again, I thought that was a very compelling, very compelling person. Um, the only last film I, I thought worth mentioning was uh, was Coco Cabana, interesting, by Manilo. Was that... Um... Coco Cabana was Barry's movie. Mm. He want, uh, he'd never acted before. Yeah. And they were looking for a director mm. who could direct an actor, uh, actors. Mm. Dick Clark was the producer. 
Dick was very famous entrepreneur mm. for American Bandstand. Mm. And I think Barry was looking for someone who did lots of music videos, and I wasn't one of those. Mm. And Dick persuaded him to think of me as a director. Mm. And Barry took me on. And I must say the experience was fascinating because he'd never acted before. Mm. And at the end of it, he was grateful to me for having worked with him. Mm. We become good friends. Uh, and I won the Emmy for the I won the Emmy for Cobra Cabana. Mm. So I'm very proud of that. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and my final question was just do you have a favorite project of, of your career and and and, and what? what? Uh, a favorite a favorite project of, of your career. Of what I've done. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything that you say this is what I'm the most the most proud of or what I'd like to be you know, people to, 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 to know about. I've done a film with David Putnam, funny enough, called Melody, hmm. which was written by Alan Parker. Hmm. And unfortunately, the title of Melody implies a musical. It's not. It's the name oh. of a girl. Yeah. It was with Mark Lester and Jack Wilde, hmm. two boys from Oliver. And I'm very proud of it because it's the first time I've worked with children kids mm. of a certain age and mm. music by the Bee Gees and I'm very proud of it as a film mm. but yes I would say that's probably one that I'm proud of mm. uh, Passage to India which I directed on television yeah something I'm proud of because mm -hmm. I had the experience of working with Simon Thorndike yeah and, and, yeah and, well thank you for, for, for talking to me um, about your career and I enjoyed all the little little areas we, we've touched on, of course, Doctor Who being in 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 particular. Um, I mean, I mean, lastly, do you think that if Doctor Who didn't exist, but somebody wanted to make it now, do you think it would? Do you, do you think there was something about Sidney Newman, nineteen sixty three, that made it become this series that it is? Is it was something special about the time in which it was made? No, I just think I, I'm not sure what the success of. What, what and how Doctor Who became so successful, it is now one of the most famous shows from the BBC. Mm. And I'm very proud to be a part of it. But I can't honestly say that I knew that it would be a success. Mm. And I don't know what it was. It's mm. a part of the magic of the, unpredict the unpredictability of show business. Mm. I mean, you, you, I think you, you go to quite a few conventions, you meet the fans, and are, are you surprised how much they, they, they love you, you, your work? Well, I go to conventions, and of course, I, I'm only a name. They don't, mm. re, I don't know, they don't know what I look like. Mm. If you're a name on the screen for five minutes, they recognise you, but they don't. I, I'm thanked by a number of fans mm. having created Doctor. Yeah. But... Um, I go to conventions because I enjoy them. Hmm. And um, yes, it's, it's interesting because not many directors are known for shows they created. No. And the irony is that if I'd known it would be such a success, hmm. I'd have had a contract. Yeah, that yeah. kept me going. I'd been quite yeah. talking to you from great heights right now. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, think of the people who created uh, Star Trek. They're multimillionaires. Mm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so what's the, the future hold? Do you have any, any projects in development? Is you still excited about? about I, I'm working on a couple of scripts, but I don't want to talk about them because until they come to fruition, I don't like to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. But I do. I like to work with writers mm. on new projects. Yeah. Have you done much work in in India and do you... No, and I want to work. It's a good thing you've asked me. Yeah. I would like to work in India, but I'm hardly ever... I must say I'm not known in India at all hmm. by the Indian film professional. Yeah. Um, I watch Indian movies with fascination because they go way over the top and they don't mind doing so. Hmm. But they're there for a purpose. They're there to entertain. And they know what kind of audience they're catering for. Hmm. They don't change formula, but I would like to do a story about Indians hmm. set in India, 
or indeed about Indians here in this country. We don't know enough about them. Hmm. It's only recently that people have started to greet each other with festival things like Diwali or Eid Mubarak. Hmm. People didn't know what that meant before. Hmm. But I'd like to deal with the British Asian family in Britain these days. Hmm. Uh, all you're seeing now is policemen or DCI, so and so, played by an Indian actor. Hmm. I noticed that in East Enders they have an Indian cast, East Indian cast, very strong storylines. But hmm. I would like to do a story set in India, set hmm. in Britain, hmm. with British Asians. Because mm. I, I feel detached from my own background mm. in my professional and my social life. Mm. I don't know enough about people from my past. Yeah. Although I do have a past. Yeah. I would been... like to talk about some other time. Yeah. <laughs> it was what it was, it was, so it would go in full circle, as you say, if you could, if you could do something like, like that. Yeah. But, um... Well, well, I very much hope that you do get a chance to to, to do that in the future, and and and, and the other things you, you wish to do. And I thank you very much for um for for chatting to me. It's been uh, been wonderful. Okay, thank you. Oh, one last thing, I don't know if you know, but there is um a rumor that they might be colorizing some of the black and white episodes for the 60th anniversary. I don't know whether that means your episodes or other people. But that's an interesting uh, element, but. Um, yeah, we're interested to see what happens with the 60th anniversary, really. Who's doing that? I don't know. I, I, yeah, I think I think the uh, the, the BBC have um, commissioned, um, and there's also the animations, isn't there, where they've animated some stories and maybe they'll animate Marco Polo uh, in, in the future or maybe it'll turn up, hopefully. But, uh, but um, no, it's an interesting year ahead, I think, for, uh, for fans of the show. But, um, well, I, I doubt if they'll be colouring the first lot. Mm. I, if they do, I'd be fascinated. Mm. I wish they would do the Marco Polo, which has, by the way, disappeared. Yeah. I know it exists, but no one seems to know where. Yeah. Uh, but it hasn't been wiped, like mm. some of my dramas. Yeah. I, I think, statistically speaking, um, Marco Polo, I think, is one of the more likely ones to come back because of the number of copies and where it was broadcast and all the... The technicality so it's kind of a bit of a wonder what that it hasn't come back before so um so but maybe with the awareness of the show you never these plate things turn up in the oddest of of places so um i mean we'll all keep our i mean we'll keep our, our fingers crossed of course um, um well let's see what happens yeah yeah <laughs> um i mean do, do you actually lastly do you actually what do you like to watch your stuff when it when it's broadcast do you, are you Yes, I'm always fascinated work. to see what it looks like. Yeah. But I've yeah. forgotten how it, a lot of it was done. Mm, yeah. So I'd like to watch what, what how, how it happened. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's see what the future brings. That'd be, that'd be nice. But, uh, well, um, but I'll, I'll let you go, Wallace. Well, it's been, been, a, it's been a delight. And um, oh. enjoy the rest of your weekend. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye.